We're a nation that speaks English. It's English. You have to speak English. This is a country where we speak English. Wise words from President Kofifi Bigley. Since the election of Donald Trump, you've probably noticed that there has been a tsunami of videos of people going on speak English tantrums, yelling at people for speaking in Spanish, Arabic, and other languages that make people afraid that they're being talked about. But did you know that there's a national movement to make English the official language of America? I'm Matt Lieb, and today we're gonna talk about how this seemingly benign movement is actually just a front for anti-immigrant, pro-eugenicist white nationalism. Oh, this episode's it's gonna be lit. It's called the Official English Movement, and on its surface, it's simply an unusually well-funded campaign to make English the official language of the US. Now, this may come as a surprise to some people, but English is not actually the official language of the United States. Nowhere in the US Constitution does it establish English or anything else as a national language, and no federal statute requires people to speak it in line at IHOP. But that doesn't stop people from saying this. Clients at your yeah, staff yeah. is speaking Spanish to customers when they should be speaking English. We speak English, English in America! Yeah. Learn how to speak English. Unbelievable. We live in America. Speak English, it's America. Ay, pinche gringos, am I right? For years, millions of English language loving Americans have been asking one simple question. Why come English ain't not the official language of America? Well, it's not for lack of trying. The modern official English movement has been going on for almost 40 years. Coincidentally, the same amount of time as the modern anti-immigrant movement. Not that they're related in any way. I mean, this isn't about race. This is about, what's this about? Our common language, English, is that which unites us. A common language creates a shared bond. I think it is essential to have a central language that we expect people to learn. A lady in my district wrote me a letter. She talked about going into a, a store, it was a Walmart store, could not find the, the item she was looking for, kept asking everybody, could not find anybody that spoke English, finally found a black lady who was stocking the shelves, asked her, mm -hmm. she, found, she took her to the, the spot. On the way she said, I couldn't find anybody else to do this, and the, and the black lady turned around and said, you know, I always knew something was going to bring us together. Who would have thought it'd be a language? Oh, uh, that did not happen. I love that this dude's idea of a heartwarming story of racial unity is a white person and a black person coming together to gang up on Latinos. Mm. The truth is that this movement to make English the official language isn't about creating unity, but rather it excludes people based on immigration status and country of origin. It doesn't take a genius to see that shrieking the phrase speak English at people, whether it's on the street or in a bill, has racial undertones. It's not like their message is speak English so we can be fucking friends. That's why it shouldn't come as a shock to anyone that the politician behind all the recent federal official English bills is Congressman Steve King, the Caesar Milan of racist dog whistles. You might remember him from such hits as saying this about Mexican immigrants. You got calves the size of cantaloupes because they're hauling 75 pounds of marijuana across the desert. Or this about Western civilization. You cannot rebuild your civilization with somebody else's babies. You've got to keep your birth rate up. Or this about our former president. We have a very, very urban senator, Barack Obama. Ooh, he really hit a hard R on urban, didn't he? Yeah, that guy is the same guy who has introduced the English Language Unity Act every single congressional session since he took office. The bills, which have never passed, would require the government to print information in English only, require Congress to do business in English only, and make speaking English a bigger part of becoming a citizen than it already is. See, King and others claim that this will encourage immigrants to learn the language, but correct me if I'm wrong, immigrants are already uber aware that learning English in America is important. Not offering any translation services or having English-only voting ballots and IRS forms only makes life harder and ensures a de facto second-class status for new immigrant populations, which these days happen to be from Latin America. But I'm sure that's just a coincidence, again. Of course, these official English politicians claim it's not about race, and they never miss a chance to compare the experiences of their European ancestors to the plight of immigrants today. My grandmother came from Germany. She sent my dad to kindergarten speaking only German. When he came home from his first day in school, he said hello to his mother in German, and she turned to him and said, speaking German in this household is for you from now on verboten. It's gonna be hard to not speak a little bit of German in kindergarten. 
I promise you, Mutter, I will no longer speak German in child garden. Official English advocates often talk about assimilation, but this idea that immigrants from Latin America aren't assimilating into the culture because they are not learning English is backed up by zero facts. In fact, studies show that Hispanic immigrants pick up language as quickly as in the days of Steve King's grandma, not because it's law, but because it's how you survive in this country. King puts a lot of emphasis on assimilating into the culture, and he tests that in a very interesting way. I've given speeches of naturalization, ceremonies. I like to go there. I like to welcome new Americans, but I can notice if I tell a joke who laughs and who doesn't. Those that don't understand English don't laugh at those jokes, but they're being sworn in as American citizens. Yeah, that's the reason your jokes are bombing. You know his jokes are probably like, okay, so a Polak, an Oriental, and a Spanish walk into a bar because it's a jail. Wow, tough crowd. <laughs> Security? What's crazy is that despite the obvious racist messaging of the official English lobby, this movement has gained a lot of ground. In fact, chances are you probably live in a state that made English its official language. 32 states have done so, including liberal Massachusetts and California. And while some people argue that these state-level bills are just symbolic, well, you know what else is a symbol? This. Okay, I know some of you right now are thinking, oh my god, just because one racist politician supports official English doesn't mean that the whole movement is racist. You left us are all the same. You think everyone's a Nazi. Well, I just want to say this. I don't think everyone's a Nazi, all right? In fact, when our producer Kate pitched us this piece, I was like, finally, I get to host an episode of this show that's not about Nazis. But then we started researching the organizations behind official English, and well, buckle the f up, damas y caballeros. This is about to get loco. The two largest organizations in the official English movement are called US English and Pro English, and they were both founded by a sweet looking old man named John Tanton. John Tanton founded US English in 1983 and Pro English in 1994, but before that, he founded an organization called FAIR, the Federation for American Immigration Reform, a group that's been behind, among other things, a push to end sanctuary cities and that 2010 Arizona bill that allowed police to arrest people on the suspicion of being undocumented also known as the Papers, Please Bill. Tanton also founded the Center for Immigration Studies, which exists solely to produce dubious studies furthering his anti-immigration agenda. He's funded or founded 12 other anti-immigrant groups, six of which have been designated as hate groups by the Southern Poverty Law Center, including FAIR and Pro-English. Now, I'm not saying that John Tanton is a Nazi, but he has founded an unusual amount of hate groups. Like, even Hitler only founded one. And Tanton has said a lot of vile things over the years. He once warned about the coming Latin onslaught, and he's corresponded with prominent neo-Nazis talking about the problems of Jewish opposition to his ideas, and he once even wrote this. Can homo contraceptivus compete with homo progenitiva? What he was suggesting with those fake Latin words is that there are different human species. Those who reproduce a lot and those who don't. Which are you? <laughs> I'm the one who f***s. High five. He's also into, wait for it, eugenics. That's right, eugenics. The Nazi practice of selective breeding with the aim of race betterment. Apparently, he was so into eugenics and population control that he even went so far as to found local chapters of Planned Parenthood. Now, there are a million reasons to support Planned Parenthood, but population control is by far the most f***ed up one. That's like supporting PBS because you desperately want to see the return of Charlie Rose. Ugh. Now again, I am not saying that John Tanton is a Nazi. I'm just saying it kind of seems like he wants to breed out non-white people. But listen, no one thing defines a man, all right? John Tanton also enjoys beekeeping. And how can that be anything but wholesome? Beekeeping it sort of fits in one of my other prime interests, which is the population conundrum that's faced by humanity. But the thing we don't notice about human population that we see in the beehive is that there's an exponential decrease toward the end of the year. This time of year, the worker bees are throwing the drones out to starvation and death. So it's a cyclical thing that's normal and uh, raises interesting questions about the human enterprise. Oh my god. All right, for those of you unfamiliar with bee lingo, a drone is a male worker bee whose primary goal is to make bee babies. So basically Tanton is saying that we should mimic the population control techniques of beehives by throwing out the ones who breed too much, which to him looks less like this and more like this. Again, I'm not saying... 
I'm not, I'm sorry, he's a Nazi. He's like an actual Nazi. I did not know beforehand that he was gonna be a Nazi. I, I didn't want him to be a Nazi. I, li some people aren't Nazis and that's good. But like, John Tanton is a Nazi. Well, the good thing about him being an obvious Nazi is at least there's no possible way that even right-wing media would have his organizations on to legitimize him, right? For the Center for Immigration Studies, Jessica Vaughn. Jessica, thank you so much for being here. Bob Dane is Communications Director of the Federation for American Immigration Reform. Bob, good to see you. Mark Mejica is the head of U.S. English. Tight, 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 tight. And what's worse, these groups are being legitimized by this administration. One former analyst for CIS has been hired as an advisor to the acting director of ICE, and a former executive director of FAIR has been hired as an advisor to Customs and Border Protection. You know, border patrol agents, like the one who recently detained two U.S. citizens in Montana after he heard them speaking Spanish. Ma'am, the reason I asked you for your ID is because I came in here and I saw that you guys are speaking Spanish, which is very unheard of up here. Which brings us back to language. The entire official English movement is rooted in white nationalism. They use the issue as a smokescreen for creating legal means to discriminate, marginalize, and spread fear against non-European immigrant communities. They don't care about English. If they did, they'd know that we've never spoken only English in America. In fact, American English is full of words from other languages. Don't believe me? Let's do a quick rewind to see how some of the words used in this very video came from other languages. Tsunami, shock, cliche, episode, uber, they, person, dollars, encourage, ballots, zero, leave, Montana, Massachusetts, California, cantaloupes, kindergarten, verboten, xenophobe, Nazi, America, America, America. America. Also, shampoo. I couldn't figure out how to say shampoo in this piece, so shampoo. Look, if there's one thing that you take away from this whole story, and uh, every story that I've covered here on Newsbroke, I want it to be this. White nationalism and white supremacy are not fringe concepts, all right? And in America, they never have been. People want to pretend that things like the alt-right and neo-Nazis are just some powerless, disorganized entity born out of the bowels of Twitter and YouTube comment sections and weird hentai websites. But the truth is that their ideas are deeply entrenched within the American body politic and institutions. The wealth, dominance, and pervasiveness of these institutions has created a facade of respectability, allowing them to take root through the use of euphemisms and dog whistles. And you know what? The rise of respectability politics has now made it a faux pas to call them out. Somehow, calling out white supremacy is seen as less respectable than actually participating in white supremacy. Pointing out racism is somehow more divisive than being a racist. None of this makes sense. Because the truth is, we value white feelings over black and brown lives. That's not an exaggeration. That's just reality. A lot of these MAGA chuds and alt-right fools are always talking about like, oh, I took the red pill, now I'm fighting against the feminists and all the racial and ethnic minorities. And that's not fighting the power, all right? That's fighting for the status quo. That's the blue pill, all right? The actual red pill is seeing that the matrix is filled with white supremacy. And being Neo or Morpheus, means dismantling it. So you gotta call it out. Don't not call it out because people are gonna get mad at you. Call it out. Amen and hallelujah. And those are both Hebrew words. Thanks so much for watching. Follow me on Twitter. And uh, you know, this is my very last episode of Newsbroke that I'm hosting. And next week will be the last one ever. I wanna thank all the fans who've been watching for the last two years. It's been a hell of a ride. A lot of me covering stories about the recent rise in fascism, but you know what? That's the way the cookie crumbles. Uh, thank you. I love you all.